Lockie Rose from Cousin Tony's Brand New Firebird. Welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks, Greg. It's nice to be here. Uh, the band plays quite an eclectic mix of music. I'm just wondering, what were the albums that you listened to in your teens that helped you form that mix? Wow, yeah, it's such a diverse mix. I mean, there was this, a, a through line of kind of like big indie pop, I guess, which it's hard to ignore. Like bands like Kings of Leon, um, I think, especially as a singer, um, were really influential. And then I'm not ashamed to say that Coldplay was also a huge one, just that the simplicity of the songwriting um, and their ability, both bands, I guess, to explore such an array of music, but also having this through line of their own sound. That's where I think I, I took so much of the songwriting ideas from. Um, and then it wasn't until a little later in my teens that I think I really connected with folk music, um, which you know, in, in, in a classic sense, like Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, and you know, even not, I wouldn't put Lou Reed in that category, but I guess more classic songwriters from the sixties and seventies really kind of like sank their tendrils in later in my teens. But there was something about the, the melodic sort of sweetness and earnestness of folk music, I think, um, that really became like the, the core of what I wanted to do. Like, even though I wanted to explore all of these styles, I always wanted the songs to be quite earnest and never like ironic or, um, or too enigmatic or something. Um, yeah. Say so those were probably like the big three. Yeah, you studied uh, at VCE, Victorian College of the Arts. How important yeah. was that time to what you do now? So fundamental. It's an interesting one, you know, because I, I think like so much of the great music we listen to is written by people that didn't necessarily study music in a formal way. And there's a lot to be said for staying out of your own way, I think, and not being too theoretical and all of that stuff. But for me, I think I just found myself in the right place at the right time. I was so committed to going down this musical path, um, but I also wanted an education, not just in theory, but in history and in jazz and in classical music. I just really felt like a student of music more than I ever had. Um, so just to be um, in a space consistently for three years was really important, I think, because you know, with any form of creativity, it's really easy to talk yourself out of it in the morning. You know, I'm just not feeling it today, maybe tomorrow. There's no one kind of cracking a whip, but um, with, when I was at VCA, I got into the habit of, well, even if I'm not feeling creative today, I will still be in a class this morning and I will be ingesting something. I'll be learning about something I didn't otherwise know about. And sure enough, by the end of the day, that had stirred up my creativity and I would go home and I'd be watching a documentary on Miles Davis or, the history of kraut rock or beethoven you know whatever it was there was just something new every day um and i think that just put me in good habits later on um yeah which i still i, I still feel quite studious as a musician because of that time i think yeah. Yeah. tell me about the band's formation coming up through the fitzroy clubs um what were the goals the goals of the band early on or how did we yeah. meet the, the, the band goals um, well, in, in its very early stage, it was just me and my very dear friend, Kieran Christofferson, who was a solo folk singer at the time. He no longer plays in the band, but I mean, because that, that's when I was so ingrained in folk music. And I think for the early period of it, we just kind of wanted to be this earnest sort of folk duo. Um, but as my interests expanded and also as I just immersed myself in the Melbourne music scene, um, I think I just took on this enormous second wave of love for more expansive kind of rock music and synth pop. Um, and as we started meeting the other members of the band, they started almost infusing the sound with their own personalities, I think, in, in some pretty unexpected ways. Like the biggest one being Francesca Gonzalez, who's one of my dearest friends. But when I first met her, I wasn't necessarily looking for anyone else to join the band, but I just heard her sing for the first time and she's this great synth player and you know she had like a guitar and stuff and I was just like all of a sudden I could just see it within the band so I, and that's always continued within the ethos of the band I think like I have a very deliberate vision within the songwriting and still do but I think allowing the band to accommodate new people 
new sounds, new aesthetics. Um, that's the thing that's kind of kept it going and kept it exciting for so long. And the things that I can't really predict. Um, so I think it's always kind of straddling that line between sticking true to my impulses as a songwriter, but also being really open, especially in studio recording, being really open to other people's ideas and really open to the project being taken in its own direction. And that's such a big part of the reason why I've never put it under my own name or, you know, I always wanted it to be a band with a particularly zany name. So it could go in all of these different directions and still kind of make a certain sense. Yeah. You're one of those bands that's very, very difficult to pigeonhole. Is that a blessing or a curse? I think it's a total blessing. I mean, on a very surface level, it's a curse. Obviously the band has a long name and it can be hard to define. So therefore it's hard to sort of pigeonhole and you know, there might be some tangible results from that. Maybe it's harder to get on particular festival bookings because people are a bit unsure of what we do. But within the, the world of the band, I think it's the best. And to be honest, I'm, I'm surprised more artists don't take that approach now because we have grown up as this first generation that was exposed to you know, all the music in the world. Music streaming you know, on one level is a pretty evil thing, but it's also incredible that we have access to all this music all the time. Um, so I've, especially the last 10, 15 years of my life, I listened to as much rock music as I listen to classical, as I listen to jazz, as I listen to, you know, and, and I think most people are like that. So when I write music, it's always been a no brainer. Or it's something I've never really had to think about that I would write in all of these different styles. Um, I'll be obsessed with one style of music for three, you know, six months at a time or something. And maybe only one or two songs of mine come out of that phase and then I'm onto something else. Um, so I think for listeners and people that are really invested in the band, that's the thing that they come to love about it. Um, and particularly within a live context, you know, my favourite shows are the ones where, you know, you're weeping to some ballad and then two minutes later you're just like rocking out to some kraut rock tune and, um, you know, bands that can kind of take you on that journey um, are the bands that I've had a lot of respect for, I think, and um, that's what people seem to get out of our live show now. Yeah. Uh, when This Is Over is the new single, first single for a couple of years. Uh, it's about the last couple of years. Um, tell me about the last couple of years for you and the single. Well, we had a particularly, well, a real sort of shock to the system as far as the pandemic went, because we were like the week that Australia and Melbourne went into lockdown was the week that we were supposed to be flying to Texas to go to South by Southwest and do this small American tour, um, which was you know, obviously a huge deal for us. So the start of it was abrupt for me. Um, so I, you know, went straight into isolation. I was isolating by myself for the first month or two, which thankfully changed. But um, my response was just to launch straight into writing, which I think, you know, a lot of musicians and, and creative people did in general. Um, but I think I recognized that quite, quite quickly. I was like, okay, the music, the live music industry is going to shut down for a while here. Um, but what else can I do? I can still write and I can still record. Um, so I took all of that energy that I had for the project and I kind of thrust it into writing. But the song When This Is Over was interesting because my first impulse, like I, I had thought long and hard about it when I was starting to write songs and I was like, okay, the, the last thing people need is to be reminded that they're in a pandemic. You know, what, what else can music do? Music can create other worlds for us. Um, not necessarily in like an escapism way, but there's just different places I can take people than reminding them that I'm a sad songwriter in isolation being miserable you know like I just didn't think that's what people wanted but then I started hearing this phrase all the time when this is over and there was something to that phrase which was like devastating but also really hopeful and people would talk about you know when, when this is over I'd, I'd really love to go to Egypt or I'd really like to spend more time with this person or I should have asked that person out and when this is over maybe I will and also within the band, some of the band members were in long distance relationships, you know, and one couple in particular still haven't seen each other after two years. So I was just privy to all of these conversations and I kind of thought, there it is, you know, at least for one song, there's the sweet spot for me. I, and a song that speaks to everyone's isolation and loneliness, um, but from a standpoint that's really hopeful of like, what, how are we going to, what's it going to feel like? Um, on the other side of that when we are connecting. So sonically, the song's really driven by that feeling. It's like this sort of turbocharged, euphoric song about um, what it's gonna be like to hug your friends again and to, you know, 
to, to share a bed with someone again, which is kind of one of the chorus lyrics and, uh, you know, just to, to go to the pub again, whether it's big or small, I, I just really wanted to capture the, the joy on the other side of it rather than capture the sadness within it. Yeah. It's the first single uh, from a new album that you're work, working towards. As you said, you've been writing a lot. Uh, is that song indicative of the others that you've been writing? Sonically, yes. Um, and the, the, I mean, like everyone, you know, I've been through such a, a roller coaster over the last couple of years, um, both artistically and personally. So the, the, the subject matter of the songs is really diverse. Um, but yeah, the, sonically, that like the, the amount of horns on this record. Uh, it's a much more live sounding record. Um, the, our previous recordings, you know, they're very finicky and there's lots of bells and whistles, which I love. It was all, you know, like bar by bar, we would construct these songs, um, but it's the complete opposite now. This record, you know, it's all kind of full takes by each band member, um, allowing a bit more room for like the humanity and the mistakes, um, but then also bringing this, um, yeah, this I, I, a bigness to it. I think through all these instrumentations, it's it's less synth heavy, and we've replaced a lot of that with live saxophones and trumpets, and um, that just felt like a way to expand the sound while still, I guess, retaining the DNA of the band. Um, yeah, so we're very excited for people to hear it. How, how we're going to pull some of that stuff off live is kind of my challenge uh, for the next few months. But uh, there was no doubt in my mind that 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 kind of fanfare of brass and saxophones was how I wanted people to feel about returning to, to the music world. Yeah. Uh, tell me about some of the gear that you personally used on the record or you're currently using. Um, well, I mean, the first thing that I always think about for our records, because I write most of the songs on a piano, um, my first thought is what piano sound is this going to be? I mean, that's on a basic level, that's the really fun thing about piano. It's that, you know, you can write a part on it, but maybe it's a Fender Rhodes, maybe it's a Whirly, maybe it's an organ. And then within organs, is it going to be a Hammond or is it going to be a, a Vox, whatever that is? Um, or, you know, or maybe it's in this world of synths. And that's, you know, that's been so different for every song that we've ever made. Um, but when I started recording with our producer Steve Mowat he just has this beautiful I sadly don't know the brand of it but this beautiful pianet like a small upright piano with the front pulled off it and so all the mechanisms within the piano are mic'd up as well um, and that is on every song on this record I think as much as I wanted to use this array of keyboards I just fell so in love with this instrument and I was just like you know, it's bold it's bright um, it almost captures the piano in the way that I wanted you know the the the, for the same reason that I wanted the brass and the saxophones to be in there all the time. There's a brightness and there's an overtness to it that I love and it's really affected the way that I play. Um, so that's given it this really classic kind of through line. Um, our bass player, Matt Hayes, um, is such a force to be reckoned with. And he recently bought a, um, a fretless bass guitar, which has been interesting because that you hear that and it's got it, I think people's ears are quite quick to put it in this really tacky 80s kind of fusion sound, but Matt's such a melodic, beautiful player that um, we've used that a lot on the record, um, which has given it a very sort of fluid groove, I think. Um, and then beyond that, it's yeah, it's really filled with brass and woodwinds. We've got some clarinet on there, there's oboe, there's flute. Um, and that was a really exciting part of the writing for me where normally I would add all those things with synths because it's just so easy and direct. Um, but I really kind of, I mean, it was stuff that I hadn't really thought about since I was at BCA, but I was like, you know, if I put in a bit of effort here, I can write up some scores and get in the players and bring this much more natural and orchestral kind of tonality to it, which to me just sounds, just sounds a bit more adult or something or like a step forward. It doesn't sound like playing with toys anymore it sounds like very considered um you know music that's deliberately written for for people to play whether or not we've pulled it off um you know that's for everyone else to judge but that's been my process so far does that mean we won't see the roll on accent the, the guitar uh the guitar is not going anywhere <laughs> Don't worry about that. That's just an extension of Fran's body. Uh, I think it's become a pretty iconic part of the band. Um, 
and my bottom line with all of this stuff especially for the live show like there's just got to be an element of fun um I never you know I've always taken the songwriting so seriously and always will but when we execute it and when we play live it's the it's the last thing I always say to the band before we go on stage I just say just have as much fun as you can like hopefully we've done as much work as you know as needed to get this show really schmick but just have as much fun as you can and the key guitar just represents fun to me I, I think that's always important yeah uh, you're one of the first signings to a new label double double drummer music um mm -hmm. what's that signing meant to the band so far I mean, obviously the music industry is a chaotic place and it's always in flux um, and people are kind of changing their musical teams all the time. But Double Drummer and particularly the man behind it, Tim Prescott, um, he's just been a through line for, through my entire career and there's never been any doubt um, that he would kind of take us through each next step. So he was kind of managing or pseudo managing my career um, just to uh, early on to, to eventually sign us off to an indie or a major label. But our relationship really became so special and we went through so much together so quickly that he kind of crystallized our relationship by forming the label Double Drummer. Um, and so we, yeah, we were literally the first band on the roster. And now I think there's maybe six or seven, um, particularly Greta Stanley, who's an incredible singer songwriter from Cairns and Dominic Breen, who's a wonderful singer songwriter from Sydney. Um, they've been on the roster for a while now and it's starting to feel like a, a bit more of a collective, but um, yeah, the, the, the guys behind Dub, Double Drummer, uh, they just have a very unique take on the industry. Um, it's very tailored to the artist um, and a, a lot of it's predicated on the artists retaining as much of their um, their control as possible. So on a more detailed level, like we, you know, all the artists are encouraged to retain the masters of the music we create, um, 100% of the, the merchandise and the live fee. There's a real understanding of where the actual money still exists um, within the music industry. Obviously recorded music has so little value now. So um, it's really important, I think, for so many labels to not discourage artists and certainly not to to set up unfair deals for them, but to make them understand, like there's still ways to survive in this world, but you just need to understand where, where that money actually flows. And of course, not that it's all about money, but um, yeah, that is such an important part of creating longevity for a band, I think, and Double Drummer so far have done an incredible job of that. Yeah. So uh, if things continue the way they're going and 2022, uh, is as normal as we hope it will be. Uh, what, what's the plan for the band? For the plan so far is kind of in two halves. I mean, as I said, with our plans to go to America before, um, you know, artistically, the first thing I want to do is just go overseas again. We, we've toured the UK. We were about to tour America. We'd love to go back to both of those places quite quickly. Um, but um, reality's you know, still kicking in and we've witnessed some bands already go overseas and their shows are still um, getting cancelled here and there or members of those bands are actually getting COVID. I, I saw that recently happen to Amal and the Sniffers, which is really tragic, but it's, you know, that's just a part of the, the climate that we're dealing with now. So for the next six months, um, we'll be touring Australia as much as possible and try and garner that that energy that we had around the band um, in Sydney and Brisbane and Adelaide and um, you know some smaller towns on the east coast where we've toured many times. Um, that'll be the next six months. But um, you know, if, if the gods allow it, um, in the second half of the year, we'd love to get back um, to um, to the UK, to America, um, hopefully some more of Europe as well. We'll have a whole third album out by then, so it's a good time to be touring. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed, but there's there's certainly enough to keep us busy in Australia until then. Yeah. Well, lucky we look forward to the new album, uh, Cousin Tony's brand new Firebird next year. And uh, thanks for chatting with us. Thanks so much, Greg. It's been lovely.